How about now? There you go. It'll help having something to speak into. Take your Bible, if you will, this morning, and I want you to turn to Luke chapter 22. And grab verse 14, and then I'd like you to also turn to Exodus chapter 12. If you will. Luke 22, we're going to look um, into verse 7 through 20, and then I'll um, make my introduction and help you pray for Pastor as he's away relaxing on vacation in St. Croix while we shovel snow. Pray for him. I don't know how you can, but pray for him, okay? <laughs> All right. Luke chapter 22, verse 7. The Bible says this, Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, the master saith unto thee, Where is the great guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished there make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, uh, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also he took the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And uh, he goes on to continue in that. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 12. And uh, we're going to pray first, and then I'm going to read part of that and help you understand what's about to be uh, partaken of today. Father, thank you today for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be here today. Lord, it's my prayer that I could, um, with mere words, picture the events that have, will take place here today and that have taken place in history. Lord, it's my prayer that I could describe it vivid enough to these people without any object lesson, so to speak, that they may understand these three events that we're going to discuss today and how important they are um, to be uh, memorized, so to speak, and memorialized for all of eternity. And Father, we ask that if there be anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, has never partaken of the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, I pray today they would find him. But Lord, also for the Christians who may find themselves a little bit mediocre concerning this subject, Lord, maybe they don't um, see it as important as it really is. It is my prayer that today it will be something that this memorial will be very special to all of us every time we partake of the Lord's Supper. And we're thankful for what you will accomplish today, Father. We give you the honor and the glory, and we're thankful for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In Luke chapter 22, um, we find that there's two divisions here. And what you find here is Jesus partakes of the Lord's uh, Supper, so to speak, uh, and he implements that for us as New Testament Christians. But before he does that, he takes down and observes the Passover meal and, and symbolizes what the Passover was all about. And in Exodus chapter 12, that's what I want to look at first, the final Passover, as Jesus is about to partake of his last supper, the last Passover meal, that will take place. And I want to give you the historical significance of this. And I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 12 and look in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. 
it shall be the first month of the year to you. And uh, to all of us, we know that as the month Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, okay, not the car, okay. And speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, verse 3, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts, on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat it not raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast it with fire, his head with his legs, and, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Verse 11, okay? And thou shalt eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Hence the word Passover. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a what, class? A memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance. How long? Forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from all of Israel. So sometimes this uh, event called the Passover is, is hooked together with the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it happened seven days uh, after the Passover took place. And of course we know that uh, Israel was in bondage to Egypt at this time, to the Pharaoh of Egypt. They were making bricks for many, many years. And God called Moses to lead this people out of bondage. And God sent nine plagues on Pharaoh and the Egyptians and told uh, Moses to tell him to let my people go. And of course, Pharaoh didn't budge one bit from those uh, plagues that happened. And some of them were pretty gross. I mean, can you imagine flies everywhere where you can't even breathe? You're swallowing them every second. They're in your eye. I hate those little gnats, you know, when you're outside playing sports and the gnats are flying around your head and they poke you several dozen times in the eye, you know. I can't even imagine, or waking up and have frogs everywhere in your house, okay. Uh, frog legs may be good, but not that many, okay. I've never had them. You can have them. I don't want them, okay. <laughs> but I can imagine having them crawl in and crawl out and you get in bed and something's cold and wet and it isn't your wife's feet, okay. It's frog's legs, okay? And you get down in there, and uh, I mean to tell you, and then you go to wash your, uh, brush your teeth or to get a drink of water, you turn on the faucet, and out comes raw blood. And I'm sure, man, everywhere you went to take a bath in the, in the river that was all blood. And the bottom line is, is that those plagues were nasty, but none of those plagues affected the children of Israel. It only affected uh, affected those people in Egypt, except the tenth one. And God told Moses to tell the people that they should choose a lamb without blemish or spot. They were to kill it and take the blood. Then they were to take hyssop, which is a kind of a weed or a plant, and they were to take and place some blood on the top of their door frame and the top of, uh, and on the two side posts. And uh, then they were to go back in the house and they were to eat the lamb. And then they were to pray. And then at midnight, the death angel would come over. And this is the 10th plague. 
the death angel would come over, and if he did not see the blood on the doorpost and the two side posts, the death angel would slay the firstborn of every household and the firstborn of the cattle. And also, it also says that he would slay the gods of Egypt, which some of those were the flies and, the, and all the other, the frogs, because they worshipped all those things, and the cattle, and et cetera, et cetera. And all of those affected, were affected that night and were destroyed. I can imagine the screaming that went on that night in Egypt. Can you imagine uh, the people, first of all, who were your neighbors watching you put blood on the top of your door and on your two side posts, wondering what are those crazy Jews up to now? They got a bunch of weird practices, and look at them. They're painting their door with blood. Sherman Williams should be down the street. They could go there. No, <laughs> okay. But they're painting it with blood. And they're trying to tell us that we need to take a lamb and slay it and do the same thing. I'm not going to. My beautiful doorpost. I just got it installed last week. I'm not going to put blood on the door. And yet that night they wished they had because the screams in the streets was unbelievable. Millions of people were killed that night. Heads of households who were firstborn children who were firstborn, the animals and their firstborn, all were destroyed that night. And that was the night that God was going to deliver Moses and the children of Israel out of the hands of Pharaoh and out of Egypt. So Pharaoh lets the Jews go, and Moses leads them out of, out, uh, out of the land. And then they get a little bit of a roadblock called the Red Sea, and Pharaoh is chasing them. And God tells Moses to put his rod in the water, and the water would come up on both sides, and that they could go through on dry land. How would you like to be the first person to go through? You just saw all that water, all of a sudden it rises up, and Moses goes, you, go. That took a lot of faith for that person to go like this, and then walk on through. And then one and a half million Jews were delivered out of the hands of Pharaoh in Egypt. And of course the water came in and destroyed all of them. Uh, uh, of the people who were chasing the children of Israel. And of course it was to be called. It was to be celebrated as a feast. An ordinance to be observed forever. And it was called the feast of the Passover and unleavened bread. And the slaying of an innocent substitute lamb brought deliverance from the judgment and the bondage of Egypt. Let me say it one more time. The slaying of an innocent substitute lamb brought deliverance from the judgment and the bondage of Egypt. They were set free. They were in bondage. And no longer are they in bondage. They are free because of that innocent plan a lamb that gave its life and its blood was shed so that the children of Israel could go free. And thus we have the beginning of an ordinance and a memorial and a celebration that is supposed to be taken care of for centuries it's been going on. It still goes on in the Jewish homes today that they offer the Passover lamb in remembrance of what took place thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. How do I know the Bible's true? That's one of the reasons I know the Bible's true. Because of this ordinance never being broken by the Jews. They don't understand it all. They don't understand the significance of it all. But yet they practice it because it was told them, passed on from generation to generation. Every year the same thing went on every single year. And it was in remembrance of that Passover lamb. Oh, that God would open the eyes of Israel so they could see what it really was all about. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you a little bit about what that Passover observance was all about. What every year, and of course what Christ did observe over here in Luke chapter 22, if you want to turn back there with me. In Luke 22, 
Jesus sends two of his disciples ahead of uh, everybody else to go and prepare. He sends Peter and John in verse 8, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And there were a lot of ceremonial things that were ha to happen. They needed to make sure there was unleavened bread. They needed to make sure that they had a lamb. They needed to make sure of a bunch of things because the lamb had to be slain on a certain day uh, before the Passover. And uh, all this was in place by Peter and John. And then, of course, they go and find the person they're supposed to, and he gives them the upper room, and they're going to be in a private place. They're not going to be out public. It was done at the last minute without telling anybody because Judas had Satan enter into him, and Judas was looking for an opportunity to publicly have Jesus Christ captured and taken out and ahead of time. And Jesus, of course, knew what was going on, so he did this privately so that Judas did not know where they were going to be. And all of a sudden, he followed them to where they were going to be. He had no opportunity to warn anybody else. And they went into this upper room, and here publicly with his disciples, they're going to partake of this Passover meal. The meal uh, was called a Seder meal, S-E-D-E-R, a Seder meal. Seder means order because there's an order to this meal. And it's practiced the same way every single year. And many of you have never, ever heard this or seen this before. Uh, it's been only recently since I've been investigating this that I really learned a lot about this. And I can't go into all the detail, but if you want to, go online and, and uh, type in Seder meal in Google and see what comes up. And you'll learn a whole bunch more things that go on. And of course, things that went on during Jesus' times have been changed a little bit by the Jews to be able to adapt some of these things. But I'm going to try to describe it real quick to you so you understand. The word Seder con meal consisted of the following. The first thing that happened, there was a prayer of thanksgiving. And the father in the home would take the cup that was filled with the fruit of the vine, it says. It doesn't say wine in the Bible. It says the fruit of the vine. Okay? And he would take and give a blessing and the blessing of thanksgiving to his family and what would happen is there were four different times where they partook of this cup of the fruit of the vine. And in the four times, some people say they had four glasses. Some people say that Jesus had one glass and passed it on. I'm not sure exactly how it went. I've never been Jewish in my whole life. Metzger is German. It's not Jewish, okay? And so I will go with that they took the same cup and they will drink it four times or do things with it four times uh, to signify what God has told them to do. And so what they would do is they would take the cup, they would give a prayer of thanksgiving for God delivering them out of the land of Egypt, and they would pray and then drink the cup, which the first cup, or the first drink of the cup, was talking about or meant sanctification setting apart for God's use. And so they would partake of the cup. Kosher grape juice, not bad. <laughs> okay? And then they partook of the cup, followed by then they had the need for cleansing to recognize how dirty they were. They would go and wash their hands. And they would have a basin of water and wash their hands. Uh, obviously, it didn't work uh, as well as it should have because after the supper, the apostles were fighting who was going to be greater in the kingdom of heaven. So that wiped out anything about cleansing of sin or, or problems because they have pride problems, jealousy problems, etc., etc. But it was a ceremonial washing because they would get ready the Passover lamb. And then what would happen? They had bitter herbs. The Bible said in the book of Exodus that they were to eat the lamb with bitter herbs. And so they would have these bitter herbs, um, probably someone suggested that it probably was parsley. Uh, they also had a bitter root, which was uh, horseradish, basically. And they would take a piece of the bread and they would dip it into this mixture, and it was called sop. And Jesus says he's at the Last Supper, and one of the accounts of the Last Supper, he talks about him dipping the sop. And so they would partake of that sop, that bitter root, 
they would take about a teaspoonful of horseradish and that other stuff and put it in their mouth. Can you imagine the results of that? I know when I get some good horseradish, I only have a little bit of it when Donna serves it at meals or whatever, and man, my eyes are watering. But it's to talk about the tears and, and the life and the tears that come with a life that's uh, lived by the Jewish people. Then they would sing the Hallel. The Hallel was, you hear the first part of that word, it's the Jewish word for Hallelujah. And they would sing a song based on their hymn book, the Hallel, which was what you have in your lap, Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. And they would pick a part of that and they would sing that out loud. I'm not going to do that because the room would clear out. Okay? Then what they would do is they would take a cu the cup the second time and they would dip their finger in it and take a drop and put one drop on the plate. Then they would take another drop on their finger and put it on their plate until they had placed ten drops onto that plate, which was significant of the ten plagues of Egypt. And then they would go on and continue in this meal. And they would put a drop in reciting all of the plagues. They had them memorized. I don't, so I'm not going to recite them. Then what they would do is something really that's unique. They had this three-compartment bag, which contained three loaves of matzah, which is bread, unleavened bread. And in each compartment, there was a square of this bread. And some people said the three compartments represents three in one, or unity. And the Jews thought that each was for part of the patriarchs that were instrumental in the establishment of Israel. So they thought it was Abraham, next, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? They also thought it represented the priests, the Levites, and the people, so it was surrounding worship. But what I know it to be, because I know why God allowed this to happen, it was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now they were to take the second piece of bread out of the middle compartment. Yes, the Jewish priests today, why did they take the second bread? They would say, I don't know. Tradition. <laughs> and they have no idea why they have to take, but they take the second piece of bread out of that bag. And what they do is they take the matzo and they break it in half. And they take the half a piece of matzo this is a little bit big, this is king size, but they took a little linen bag and what they did is they opened up this bag and placed the matzo in here. And then what they would do is they would go and they would hide it. The father would take it, no one else in the family knew where it was, they would hide that bag. And it was significant because the son, Jesus Christ, was broken and he was buried and this little bag will be coming back again to be part of the Passover meal and it will come back again. This little bag was called, um, see if I have it written here, Afi Komen, Afi Komen. And this is still done in Jewish homes today. Everybody partakes the same way. And of course, before they ate the supper, they opened the second compartment and took the unleavened bread out and broke it and put it away. And because it means, Afi Komen means it will come later. That's what it literally means to the Jewish people. And so they would eat the main course, which consisted of a Passover lamb. Today in most Jewish homes, it doesn't consist of lamb. Because when Titus destroyed the temple, they, they no longer celebrate the Paschal Lamb, so to speak, because they're in mourning over the destruction of the temple. 
So they eat roast beef or, you know, they can't eat pork, so they don't eat any ham, all right? Um, but they eat other things in representation of the lamb. Sometime before they're done with the meal, okay, they would eat that main course, which this went on for hours. That's why Jesus told the disciples to sit down, have a seat. In the first Passover, they were told to get ready to run out the door as soon as the Passover lamb was slain uh, and the Passover happened, they were told to get out. They had to take their belongings and run for their lives, so to speak. But now this thing goes on for four to six hours. They're eating, you bring your appetite when you come because it's going to take a long time to go through there. And then during the meal, sometime at the very end, the kids were told to go and find the bag, the afikonen. And they would run around the house looking for it, and all of a sudden, one of the kids would find it, and they would take it from its hiding and bring it back to the father, and the father would give them a reward for finding the piece of bread. Then, if I could find the right opening here, he would reach into the linen bag and he would take this piece of bread and he would take it and he would begin to break it and begin to pass it around the table to his family members. Because this bread was a significance to being about the Passover lamb that was broken and slain for the redemption of Israel. But we know that it has a greater meaning and a greater symbol. It's talking about the, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what then would happen when this was done, they would then partake of the third fruit of the cup. And I believe this was the cup that Jesus would refer to because he said after he had supped, he took the cup. So he's done eating the Passover meal. He takes the cup, and this time the cup represents this um, uh, fruit of the vine that is representative of the cup of blessing and the cup of redemption. And for the Jewish people, they were redeemed out of the bondage of Egypt and brought forward. And someday they were looking for the redemption when their Messiah would come, that Elijah would bring Messiah in and would take and redeem all of Israel to himself forever. And of course, this is the third cup that we know that God was talking about because of, of the significance of the, of the things that took place. But one of the most thi important things to see here in Luke 22 is that he tells them he would not drink of the fruit of the vine again until the kingdom of God would come. So this was his last partaking of the fruit of the vine. And he would drink it, and it would be the last time, he said, until he drank it with them, in the kingdom, thus predicting the second coming of the Lamb of God, who would come to take away the sins of the world. We know this to take place when he comes back again at Armageddon, and then is set up in Jerusalem on the throne, and will reign for, for 1,000 years first, and then he will then destroy the earth, and he will reign forever and ever. That is when he will partake of the cup again in his kingdom. And he will do it again, the Bible says, in the book of Revelation, out in eternity. Okay, And we probably will partake of this at the marriage supper of the Lamb for all of us. Then it's not done. After that cup happened, what would take place is um, there was an empty place setting. And the fourth cup of the fruit of the vine was a cup of praise, and they would recite another um, prayer which would um, basically tell them that they would partake again next year in Jerusalem. So they were always looking forward, hoping the Messiah would come next year in Jerusalem. 
And then they did this uh, kind of in, in, important thing. They would send a child to the door, and everybody would stand around the table, and they would wait for the child to open the door, and hoping that Elijah was there, and that Elijah would come and bring with him the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, or their Messiah. And he would bring them, and they could welcome them to their Passover table, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, of course, we know that that didn't happen, and it won't happen for them. However, John the Baptist was called to ha and said to have the spirit of Elijah. And when he points to Jesus coming, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So they were waiting for Elijah, and when they were done, they sang a song, and they went out, and the Passover feast was over. That's how they celebrated it. See a lot of the symbolisms in there for us? And of course, now, this was also not only the Last Supper and the last partaking of the Lord of the Passover meal, but this was also the beginning of something new for us. Jesus ate the lamb, but he also was the lamb. He's the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Revelation 13, 8 says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. God had this all planned, interwoven throughout history of where he would show Jesus to be their Messiah and their Savior, but they didn't accept him. They didn't take it. So in John chapter 1, verse 29, of course, Jesus says, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So now we turn to the bread, this matzo bread, the bread from the afikonin, the bread of affliction, it's called. It was taken by Jesus to be a symbol of his body. It was fragile. It was subject to death. How would you like to go to the store and ask for a loaf of bread and get this? That's what it was. That's what they considered the loaf of bread, so to speak. It was unleavened bread. It wasn't risen. Someone said, we ought to go out and get a huge, big, doughy bread and have people. That's not what it was. It was unleavened bread. So hence, when you get the bread passed today, you will take a piece of matzo or bread, which is unleavened, the picture of something without sin. And then, of course, they would take that, it would represent Jesus being the fragile lamb, subject to death, given for you. It was a symbol of the suffering lamb, slain so we could go free from the impending judgment. The death of an innocent substitute, the lamb of God, Jesus. Of course, Isaiah 53 describes that lamb and talks about and prophesies. Isaiah 53 is not in the Jewish Bible in the Old Testament. It's not there. It goes from 52 to 54. Isaiah 53 is missing in there. And it says in verse 5, But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. If you look close at the matzo, Okay? It's unleavened, so it's holy. It's pure. It's pierced so that when you bake it, it will go through and through. And you can see holes in it. You can't really see the stripes really good, but the stripes flow through this because it was baked on a rack. And you could see the stripes. And so the bread was unblemished, pure and holy. It had holes piercing it. And it was baked on a rack so you could see the stripes. And of course, he goes on, All we like sheep have gone astray, have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened out his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare this generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. 
Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. So we eat today. Jesus told us that he would give us this to partake of the Lord's Supper. That we would continue this on until he comes. And we are to do it as often as we ought. And in 1 Corinthians, if you'll turn there with me. Chapter 11. Luke was also written after the after like some of the Pauline epistles, so it really wasn't a contemporary of Jesus' time when he wrote. He saw what Jesus did. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, what you find here, it says this. Verse 23 of chapter 11, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, tradition of the um, a little piece of bread, the half piece of bread was broken. It was broken, and he said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. At this time, I'm going to ask the ushers to and the deacons to please distribute the bread so you could partake and pretend that Jesus was breaking this bread for you, for you to partake of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't his literal body. It was representative of that broken lamb. It was also representative of his broken body, which was beaten and bruised. And so what I want you to do is, as these men come and pass you the broken bread, I want you to take it. I want you to take and pray and remember what this was all about. I want you to examine yourselves and the song's going to play, and then I want you at some point during that song for you to partake of the bread, right? me 
the blood. The blood was significant, represented by the cup of the fruit of the vine. The Bible talks about that when you squeeze grapes into the cup, it's the pure blood of the grape. And so as the fruit of the vine was being offered by Jesus, he was teaching them a lesson. If you look in Luke 22 once again, Verse 19, he says, and he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, this is the body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, see, saying, this is the third cup now. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. This cup. The cup he's offering them is the New Testament in his blood. And what he was trying to tell them is he's going to take the old covenant and do away with it. And from that day forward, he was going to start a new covenant. We call it the New Testament. The Testament does not begin until you have the death of the testator. Okay, that's not some special potato you put in the oven, okay, to test something. Okay, testator, no, okay. The testator was Jesus Christ. So the New Testament doesn't begin when Matthew chapter 1 in your Bible starts, okay. It doesn't get ushered in until the lamb dies and his blood was shed because it was by the blood of a slain individual where the testament was ratified, where it was declared, where it was sealed, so to speak. And so Jeremiah 31, if you'll turn there real quick, in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Jesus pronounced this to go take place. It was prophesied that this would happen. All the way back in the prophet Jeremiah, when he's dealing with Israel, in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, he declares that this is going to be the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of a new. In 31, 31, Jeremiah 31, 31, this is what he says. He said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a what, class? A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Which, by the way, my covenant, they what? They break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law where, class? in their inward parts and write it in their before it was written on a tablet of stone now he's going to write it in their hearts because he's going to dwell with them and will be their God and they shall be my people so what he was trying to tell them that this old covenant the law there were no more ceremonials going to take place there were no more rites there are no more rituals. There's no more priesthood. There's no more sacrifices. There's no more temple. There's no more holy of holies. And there's no more Sabbath. By the way, it wasn't the doing away of the moral law because God is moral and they still needed to follow the moral law. But the rest of the law would be taken care of, the dietary laws, etc., etc. But it also meant this new covenant was the beginning of the new covenant. It speaks of Jesus being in the inward parts. And so thus it was significant that after this, Jesus was raised on a Sunday, not the Sabbath, as before. And then he was told the people in the church, the first church, they were meet on the first day of the week, not the Sabbath, a Sunday. And so it signified this new covenant that he would bring in all because of the shedding of his blood. 
The blood was a symbol of the Lamb of God who would shed his blood. He would be beaten. He would be bruised. He would be punched. He would be whipped 39 times. They would put a crown of thorns with poisonous type needles, big thick ones, and they would beat it into his head and it would mingle with his blood. He would be taken to a cross and here, there he would stretch out his arms on his own. No one had to force him. And they would place the nails about right there to hold him because if they put it in his hand, they would rip out at the weight of his body. They put his feet together and did the same thing. And then they dropped him in a hole where while he was fastened, everything would come out of joint. Not a bone was broken because it couldn't be but it would come out of jo a joint and the fluid would begin to flow. The lymph fluid would begin to flow into his body and then he would struggle to breathe. He would push himself up and take a breath and let himself down again. And the blood and water continued to flow into his cavity, hence kept cutting off his air supply. He would reach up more to take another breath and the more he did that, the more the fluid would rush in. And so basically on the cross at Calvary, not only did you die from having being bleeding out, but you would also die of suffocation. And that blood was shed as it rolled down his head and his hands and his feet. And then some soldier comes and shoves a spear into his side and out comes the water and the blood all staining the hill at Calvary and the cross. That precious blood was the cleansing agent for our sin. It was the only thing that God the Father would accept as the payment for our sins. It was the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the men to come and distribute the fruit of the vine, representative of that blood that was spilled on Calvary's mountain. And as the men distribute that, I'd ask you to take that cup and pray and thank the Lord in the remembrance of what his blood was shed for you. And then I want you to listen to the song, and then at some point you may drink of the cup.
no greater love, grace, how can it be, that in my sin, yes, even then, he shared now you see why we're told to do this in remembrance of him the Bible says in Corinthians as often as ye do it we don't do it real often around here because we don't want to take it for granted it is very special and it is not the body of Christ and it is not the blood of Christ it's a symbol of that as you saw it pictured in the Passover supper and in the Passover itself and now into eternity until Jesus comes again. And I can't wait for that day. Let me ask you a question. Have you received the Lamb? Have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior? Have you taken that blood that was shed and applied it to the doorpost of your heart? So that when the death angel comes over, he's not looking for what church you go to, how good you are, what religion you are. He's looking for whether the blood has been applied. For me, it was June 15, 1971, and 8.30 at night, that's when my blood was applied. It was the blood of Christ applied to my heart. Do you have the blood applied? Can you celebrate the Lord's Supper with us knowing what it represents and knowing what it's all about? Have you now a better meaning of why it's so important to remember? Do you understand why we're to observe the Lord's Supper till he comes? Have you accepted the Lamb of God to be your personal Lord and Savior? Have you been washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you now understand why good works could not save you? What a Savior. Let's stand for a word of prayer. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe today you want to just come down and continue thanking and praising him. Maybe you want to come and find out what it means to be saved. Maybe you want to come and tell the Lord, Lord, I didn't realize how special this is in my life. And I need to live better for Jesus Christ because of the price he paid for me to make me clean and I need to come and confess my sin and be clean for you and serve you I don't know what the Holy Spirit has for you but as you hear this song the old rugged cross you do what the Lord would like you to do in this invitation time on a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And 
Father, thank you today for the opportunity we have to heed the call to remember the broken body of our Savior as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world, and the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. As we continue to memorialize this, Lord, help us not forgive, forget in the power of that and what it can do to save men's souls and change their lives completely. Thank you for this new covenant that was ratified in your blood so that we could accept you as our personal Lord and Savior. And all the people said, Amen. Please be seated as someone gives us the announcements. That would be me. That would be awesome. me. Awesome.